Hi there, welcome back to my beautiful Disclosure channel, disclosing and opening doors that many people don't want to open, but on this channel, we open them. We open the tunnels too, and we look inside the caves, the very caves of darkness. Now, um, before we go into that kind of information from this beautiful woman, Rachel Vaughan, who is a survivor of a family that she was born into with her siblings, ritualizing, satanic, horrendous horrors you've never even imagined were possible. But this lady has survived with her mind, her body and her soul. She is such a beautiful soul, so pure, so serene, so lovely. I'm so proud to know her. Um, the great joy that has come from her trauma has led her to be sharing now as a real solid voice on our planet of ley lines and energy and just beautiful information of the earth itself. And she's going to be speaking at Uluru, Uluru. A conference from the 20th to the 22nd of December in Australia. I'll come back to that a bit later, but for now, let me welcome my friend, Rachel Vaughan. Lovely to see you, Denny. And I have to say thank you, and, and you make my heart sing when I see you too. <laughs> We're so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh, thanks, darling. Yeah, we've been obviously having quite a long chat before we hit record and just honouring you for how difficult it is you know it's not just a random story what you share it it does affect you and um, I remember our first interview together you were explaining to me that if you seem like you're emotionless it's because that's how you get to deliver and it hurt my heart that you would even have to say that you know but uh, but you are so brave and you do represent a voice of Australia and the underground and the hidden and the unseen and the hidden hand and so we're going to go into um, some of the details um, of this life that you've lived thus far um, <clears throat> on the dark side. Um, and we'll start with um, the rituals and you just go where you feel led. Well, so the first, one of the very first memories I have is as a toddler and um, an expert on um, SRA told me this, this was actually a ritual as well. So that was um, in a, what, was a butcher um a, a building right next to that um and my father took me there I was barely able to stand and I had to watch while he was basically putting two cadavers into two um suitcases so sorry that it's coming to something so horrendous so early but when you talk about rituals this is the sort of stuff that you get so that was one of the first memories that I have having to watch that and it was a completely it was a steel lined room completely lined with stainless steel um, and I can still remember the sounds and things, you know, and this is one of the things that a lot of ritual abuse um, survivors will talk about. It's not just a visual memory. You will have feelings in your body when you remember, you will have sounds and smells. Um, and they leave, they leave really interesting, you know, imprints. So, you know, I have issues with hair on the floor and I still do have that problem because of the things that I saw, you know, bathroom floors and things really messed with my head. Um, I find it difficult to go into hairdressers and things like that because of that. Uh, so, you know, it, it's it's fascinating the weird nuances and issues that you have after you've had these sorts of experiences. And, yeah, the, the reason why I mentioned, you know, sometimes I will laugh when I'm when I'm talking about the most horrendous things. It's a, it's partly a coping mechanism. But it's also if you're if you're rocking in the corner, people don't want to watch that. They're not interested in hearing the story and you don't get this, the message out and people don't get healed by it. So you have to be the best possible representation of people who've gone through this when you do these sorts of interviews. I have one particular troll um, who, who would come onto every interview I've ever done and say, oh, she's laughing, she's she's having fun. It's just it's just ridiculous. So, I mean, clearly this is not somebody who understands the, the, the trauma and the human mind. So that's, that's the reason why I share that. I had some, you know, well, there was quite a few rituals that I was involved in. Some were open air. So um, one in particular I have spoken about quite extensively where there was a massive bonfire. And and I think I spoke about this on your channel um, last time, but they had they had Boy Scouts come and actually do the the hard work to bring in the sticks and the and the wood. And these were little boys in, in uniform. They came in a bus and they helped produce all the the uh, the litter, I suppose, or the the um, the stuff to burn. Um, then they were gone. I lost time, and then the 
the adults turned up over a period, other children turned up. And that was the one where I've described seeing um, a baby unalived. And the person who presided over that ended up in a very powerful political position in my state. And this is this is the way that the mentorship occurs in places like Adelaide, South Australia. Um, I know that this happens in Sydney and Victoria in Australia as well. Tasmania is known for it also. Um, I'm sure it happens in the other states and territories as well, but you just don't hear about it as much. So these these groups, they do these rituals on purpose because it it aligns them with each other. They they have material on each other. They can't uh, speak against each other. And there's a whole series of really quite, this is a Freemasonic thing. So a lot of cults are either Freemas Freemasons, Eastern Star Sect, which is the female version. You've got the Rosicrucian um version also which is the Scottish right um they, they'll do this so that they've got blackmail material on each other and and you're seeing this now with um the state sanctioned trafficking of children that you see in most western countries now it happens in America the UK um Australia you had you had you know riots in Leeds recently that was because they took some children away from some parents for an absolutely ridiculous reason and people people stood up and thank god they did Thank God they did. And why doesn't that happen more often? I mean, it shouldn't be possible for this to, to occur. So in those situations, it's a blackmail situation again. So you'll get a, a family that's fighting. Parents are, are against each other. One might recognise that the other one's doing something terrible to the children. That'll get out in, in, in some sort of statement to police. And then the police go around and know they can own the abuser. And then they can traffic their child. And so... You know, it's it's quite it's quite horrendous how intricately woven the web is, so that these people have control. Thankfully, now I see that that is absolutely disintegrating. What control they had, and the experience with Leeds is is just a perfect example of that. They can't keep it hidden anymore. People are reacting to it. People know enough now to stand up. So, um, some of the other rituals that I I was um, involved in, you know, it was th th there was a whole it wasn't just the sitting around with the items on the floor and the chanting and that stuff. There's a whole series of events that lead up to it. So at 14, I was taken by my MK Ultra abuser and, and um, handler and programmer, the main female one. She took me to buy a dress for some sort of special dinner that I had to go to. I didn't realise that it was another form of initiation. I'd had many, um, but I did feel uncomfortable and nervous about it. And it had to be this black and white dress specifically. And I was taken to this um, Tudor style resort, which was also black and white, Tudor style white sort of with these weird um, sort of black sort of um, buildings. And then sat at a particular table and these certain events occurred. And then we were taken out to a, a back room and, you know, a pretty horrible experience occurred where, uh, you know, a whole series of events happened and I was married to somebody. I'd already had... Um, a betrothal ceremony with my father where he tried to sell my soul as well but I thankfully muttered under my breath that I was giving my my soul to Jesus it's so convoluted and, and complicated what they do and if you look at some of the um the the secret books of Freemasonry you'll see after a certain oath if they break that oath there is a specific ritualistic murder or torture or you know a removal of limbs they do things very specifically and it's it's all about terrorization and it's all about control what's happening now is incredible because the veil that was keeping everybody in cognitive dissonance that was preventing people from understanding that these things really do happen that is lifting it's disintegrating very rapidly and i believe that's because we've got some very powerful energies changing with the ley lines with the earth's energy lines her it's basically her soul her meridian system is coming to life we're moving into a higher frequency and it's affecting everybody and it's interesting what you're saying before about the energies at the moment are really very intense and can be quite scattered so if anybody's feeling that you know don't don't be hard on yourself it's just how it is it's just how it is and it will probably be like that on and off particularly until december this year when the ley lines do come into that permanent harmony time. It's it's a very magical time to be alive, but we need to sort of be pretty, pretty vigilant that we're taking care of ourselves, doing as much cleansing and clearing as we possibly can, putting protection techniques up um, and just being aware of what's going on, just observing, trying not to get to, don't get caught up in the fear porn. 
just observe and be aware of what everything is happening. Yeah, it's so important. Yeah. Let's step aside from the rituals and the darkness. And thank you again for sharing so much. It is horrendous, uh, but needs to be shared. As you've raised the beautiful frequency of the earth and the dragon lines, let's share with this beautiful audience um, what exactly is happening and what will be happening with the dragon lines at Uluru. It's just so precious. And you've been chosen to be there. I've, I'm so honoured. So this is the Cosmic Consciousness Conference. Um, and I was invited to go. I desperately wanted to go to Uluru. Um, so just, just to um, pre preface it, Uluru is this incredible, sacred, massive rock in the centre of Australia. And it is the crossing point of two dragon lines. Dragon lines are the largest of the ley lines on the planet, and they are massive. Um, we had six pairs up until 2017 when a new a new dragon line appeared, another one, a new, another new one appeared in 2018 and another new one in 2019. And that was just before we have all these crazy things that happen on this planet. So that was that influx of frequency, that influx of powerful earth energy. That's what's, I think, apart from the solar codes that are coming in, all the other amazing codes that are coming in, that's part of this awakening. It's a big part of this awakening. There's a, a, a an amazing man called Rory Duck who's a geobiologist and he has foretold in an interview with Pam Gregory, who's one of my favourite astrologers, she's very lovely, um, that in December of this year, all of the ley lines on this planet will go into what's called permanent harmony time. Now, the harmony time of the ley lines normally is for a few hours or a few days around the equinoxes and solstices. We're coming into permanent harmony time in December of this year. As far as I know, um, I mean, the earth might have gone through this through the ages previously, but we certainly haven't had this in many thousands of years, if not tens of thousands or possibly millions of years. This is a significant event. Um, I tried to sort of organise to go to Uluru in June of this year, and it just didn't work out. I, I just remember feeling this feeling, it's just not the right time. Just just give it up. Don't worry about it. Do another time. I, I sort of talked to my course members about maybe meeting them up there, and it just didn't feel right. And then just out of the blue, these beautiful people at the Cosmic Consciousness Conference invited me up. So I realised now I wasn't supposed to go in June because I was supposed to be there in December when the harmony comes in. Um, and it's quite funny because I, I've been a psychic for my whole life and I've been I've been using my psychic abilities professionally for over 20 years um and I'd always heard stories about you know particularly in the last 10 years about us coming into 5d and I and I just sort of thought oh well that's isn't that a sweet little fairy tale and that sounds really nice and I, I wish it could happen but you know I, I didn't believe it was possible but as soon as Rory Duff said that we're coming into this permanent harmony time in December it's like because I know the ley lines are fifth dimensional frequency I just suddenly recognised and realised, oh, good grief, that's it. I can suddenly see that's how it's possible. It, it never occurred to me that it wasn't more than just a, you know, a dream or a hope. It's literal. So my belief is that once we come into that time, it's going to be very, very difficult for the attachments and the darker elements to have power here. They really will struggle. They're already struggling. That's why we're seeing all this weird stuff going on. They, they will find it very, very, very difficult. So I have great hope. Um, I put out a post a couple of days ago, was it yesterday, about the golden age, that there are all these beautiful ancient prophecies of a golden age coming. Um, and actually Catherine um, for the Cosmic Consciousness Conference put out a, um, uh, an article of her own sort of describing that and, and some of the words that I put, put together um, a couple of days ago. We're, we're coming into a time, so... There was um, Greek mythology around a thousand years of golden age. There's the Satya Yuga of the Kali Yuga prophecy of a thousand years of golden age. And they all talk about this time of harmony. And I'm realizing that's the harmony time. I recognized that this was coming in 2020 when I, I read an article on the Satya Yuga. Um, and it's it sort of, it was another one of those moments like watching Rory Duff and Pam Gregory having this conversation suddenly everything made sense to me because I had been seeing all of these little babies coming in around 2015 because I read auras with gold halos around them and I'm thinking this is really interesting and I, I, I intuitively realized Jesus Christ had the same sort of gold aura and this is a Christed frequency this is a you know a gold soul frequency 
well, now I know why we're going into the golden age as well. So humanity holding a high frequency helps the earth to get to these higher levels. So it's this influx of gold souls that are coming in that have brought us about, have brought about along with all of the other codes coming in and, and sun, solar flares and everything else has brought us to this higher frequency as well. So it literally, you know, I know it's been hard the last four years and, and for some of us it's been hard all of our lives, but it's worth it to come to this point. It is worth it because we're going to see a completely different paradigm coming up. The dark will not have rain. That's right. I love the way you said that. The dark will not have rain. And they are getting a clue now. I mean, there's an element that still truly believe that they're going to dominate the planet. They're going to roll out Zaveth. You know, I see Clown Schwab was stepped down about time. Um, you know, those old windbags, him and Soros and the other satanic, you know, that people don't realize they were sitting ahead of a you know, there's the Pinder and the Phoenix of the, you know, the Brotherhood. I mean, it's a very real thing, you know, and like, why would some Hungarian bloke be actually advising America? Like people don't seem to sometimes think around and beyond what's actually happening. Who are the big old windbags at the top? You know, some of them host the most evil demonic energy and we're just so programmed, admire authority, be respectful. No. They're all a load of bollock heads. Do not respect them. That's how we got in trouble. It's time to wake up, wake up, wake up. God, my God. There were so many things in that beautiful last expression that opened, you know, <laughs> um, in me. You mentioned about psychic children. And, you know, we all have abilities. We know that. Someone like you, who was also being uh, trained, trained and groomed, from birth, probably in the womb, with the rituals and the abuses begin in satanic families of which you were born into. Um, just say for us, if you can, um, your dead dad, um, your dead dad, the pedo uh, murderer, his name. So his name's Alan Maxwell McIntyre, or it was Alan Maxwell McIntyre. He was, you know, a lot of these pedos use their middle name. So his name was Max, like people knew him as Max, but his real name, his real name, first name was Alan, um, which was, you know, an acronym or, a, you know, you could turn the le letters around for something else that he that he had a, a propensity for. Um, so, yeah, very, very co-opted soul. I often wonder if he was just simply, I, I know he was traumatised. He was definitely traumatised because his grandfather was, the head of the Freemasons, um, Joseph Wright, was a very high up Freemason, grand president of the Grand Lodge. So I know he would have had abuse. And apparently his mother was head of the Eastern Star Sect, which is the female version of Freemasonry. No doubt she got into that position because of her father's position. So, you know, he probably didn't have much chance. But, you know, I I brought up and I was brought up in a terrible family and I didn't go dark. You know, it, it is a choice. It is a choice. Um, people choose the wrong path and he chose the wrong path. You're right. It is a choice, Rachel. Uh, all these people that are raised being beaten up by their parents and they get to have their own and they don't go ahead and beat them or harm them. So it definitely is a choice. And if that triggers somebody, oh, well, there's a trigger. When we get triggered, we can then take some action, move to action, whether it's a scream, a cry, a yell, a laugh, it doesn't matter as long as we're moving the pain out of us. Um, but with the psychic children, um, as you went through the horrors and were groomed and and your natural ability was there, but it was definitely enhanced um, with protocols that the cult, the dark satanic cult have and have been using for decades. With me as a very psychic child, my horror and terror was the demonics and the bad energy and the hauntings in the house and the land I lived in, in the area, a very repressed, violent area. So I naturally honed mine. Well, the other night this week, I hung out with a couple um, and really nice people. And the lady in particular, the lady in particular, at some point in her life was trained at a very high level of magic. And she sat with that weird bloke with the crazy eyebrows, Aquino. Is it Michael Aquino? I feel yes. so sick when I see him, look at him. I didn't even know what he was. Um, but just the look, it's that, Ugh, that vibe, that Ugh, there's something butchery and bastardy and evil about him. And then, oh, my God. So she trained with him. But here's the thing. 
and I believe her. She never, ever saw. There were so many people at her level of high magic, you know, at the temple of Seth that, that that bloke created or set, but she never saw it. But that, it makes sense. It makes sense, you know? It's like, um, I remember years ago going to a party with people at this great house on this great land in California. And there was lovely people and 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 all of a sudden, the shift, I'm like, what was that? I'm like, are these people on drugs? And just something shifted at the point. What a lovely time. And I was mostly with the friends I went with, you know. And then I felt it. And there was this man. He was a huge, giant man with a giant belly. He hasn't seen his willy for forever. Um, and um, he walked around and he came over to me and he said, we're going to have a gathering. It's not for everybody, but we'd like to invite you. And then I realized it was a sex party, an orgy. And I am not your girl for that. I'm so not that girl. And I told my friends, I went, oh my God, I said, I think we need to go. This is going downhill. That I just got invited into this skank party. And then one of the guys we were sitting with, he went, yeah, because I thought you'd be up for it. I'm like, no, mate, wrong girl, you leave. Um, but they then started like people that were there for that going in the house and shutting the doors. I'm like, holy God, it was so beyond ick. It was so, and then the man kept calling me, trying to get me to a meeting of some nonsense and oh, it was horrible. But um, I know I went off a bit off track there, but again, for people to recognize, you know, that we come in with these abilities to sense and, and to, to sense them, but yes. so, so my point again is being invited like this lady I'm talking about, the high ritual magic, she never saw anything. She never saw anything at that level. But there were signs like me at the party, for example, there are signs you start to see. Anyway, this lady and her husband and her husband has also trained in high magic in different ways. They are so in love. They are so cohesive together. It was lovely to see them in their body language and their genuine. He adores her. Um, and, you know, People can say, well, these have been, they've done a Ouija, but, and they've done a Ouija at a levels, and I'm so against a Ouija, I talk about it a lot, but the, this couple, the lady, when we were talking, um, I said, I understand you, you've, you've been trained in a Ouija at a very high level, meaning you can also see everything that comes in when you open that portal, but most people don't. They don't see what they open up to when they try and get ahead in their spiritual growth and they end up being possessed. You know, it's awful. awful. Exactly. So <clears throat> I wanted to say that about the different levels of training where not everybody gets involved in that. But the signs of you are being groomed, the systems all have elements of this in there, don't they? They absolutely do. And it's interesting, you know, when you mentioned Akina with the eyebrows, he 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 specifically trains them to look like horns. You know, that's a pretty big sign that someone's dark. But I know that his bent was hypnosis. So she probably wasn't able to pick up on what he was doing because he would have, you know, my father had induction, rapid induction techniques that involved hand movements. And he, he would have control of people through these hand movements. So, yeah, he was a magician in some way as well. And that's what these people learn this stuff so that they will have these abilities. But the thing with magic is there's good magic and there's dark magic. When people use dark magic they've sold some of their soul or all of their soul to have that ability and usually they'll take on an entity that controls it through them so for instance you know Alistair Crowley was um, known for tripping people up from behind he could he could get within the auric system and trip them up so they fell over I mean you know it's just a party trick it's not very special or not very significant but you know obviously he thought that was enough to sell his soul for um, so and I can understand why your friend might not have picked up on it because these people are very well trained in this way with the orgies that that sex magic that is another way that they it be, creates a familiarity it's also about ranks so certain people have to you know they might be young and beautiful but they have to have you know convergence with the old people I suppose that they might not necessarily find attractive because it gives them power in in the sect in the group I mean, you know, I had, I had a family member who would regularly organise orgies and she was very open about it. <laughs> She's one of the ones that goes against me and my siblings speaking out about what our father was involved with. She just thinks it's normal. It's not normal. 
It's just not normal behaviour. It's it's debauched. And fine if people want to do that, if they think that's normal. But when you start to do those sorts of behaviours, what you're actually, you are being governed by the sacral chakra, the sexual chakra. You're being governed, and there's nothing wrong with the sacral chakra. This is where babies come in. But it can be uh, darkened. It can be influenced. It can be used in the wrong way. And this is sex magic is not something that people really need to be mucking around with in my opinion because the the likelihood of danger um of calling on the wrong kind of energies and bringing them in it's 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 significant you, you have to be very very careful it's very different to the sort of magic that you might produce with somebody that you truly love especially when you want to make a baby that is that is so powerful if you want to use that magic to create life that is very very different that's that's a completely different thing i believe that all children are psychically open from my understanding the veil that stops us from realizing how psychically open we are that stops us from remembering past lives that stops us from seeing the things under the bed and the scary things that you saw darling and you obviously didn't have anybody around you that would help you with that which is terrible those things seem to start to dim and fade around the age of five for most children some like us never get to ignore it it's always there um the idea is that you, you know, you would hope to choose parents that would protect you in some way. Did you have anybody who could protect you? No, but our dogs did save my life because the worst night when there were all these demonics yes. pressing down, using some kind of magic, pressing down like a mattress and suffocating me and I was losing breath. And there was a huge demonic on the wall that was advising oh. them. But, and then the dogs, the dogs heard me screaming, squealing, because obviously the high pitched decibels dogs picked that up and they're scratching at the door. Uh, and then my, then my mum and dad got alerted and they came in and I was like barely breathing. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Happy oh. <laughs> and I had Jesus. Oh, Jesus turned up in my room one day with the angels. So I so so that that was good. That was good. Yeah, I mean, you know, Jesus was basically the patron saint of children. They don't really sort of connect that dot often enough because I know so many survivors who had connection to Jesus also. And it wasn't the other archangels or, or angels specifically. He was the one that came to them. And I've had a connection with Jesus ever since I was very small also. Like I said, I, I you know, I gave my soul to him at a time when I really, given given what I was going through, I certainly didn't get religious instruction <laughs> apart from the satanic stuff, but I knew who he was. And I knew that that's where I, my soul was aligned and I didn't want anything to do with what these people were up to or what my father was trying to sell me into. So, you know, children can be unbelievably wise because, again, they've come from the soul world. They are still, that, that veil hasn't descended completely. They haven't forgotten who they really are. Yeah, children. And I think this is another reason, well, no, it's another reason why they play with children, they use children. Partly they are jealous because children have beautiful un, un um sullied souls even though we're, the christian i'm oh, sorry the catholic faith will tell you that you are born of sin which is absolutely ridiculous you right. know that they're perfect and pure and and they'll go to heaven when they pass and you know these these people that sell their soul they know what's coming for them they know that it's dark they know that they're not going to ever get their soul back they know where they're going when they pass it's very very sad can you imagine the nightmare that the, of a life that would be? And I, you know, I watched my father on a daily basis. You know, I could see him grappling with that. He might have had power, but he was certainly wasn't happy. Wow. As we've raised certain subjects, and I know people watching this will be thinking about current times and what we just watched, the debauchery on Paris in Paris. Um, it was so interesting, the the propaganda the media. So they show this, whatever that was, which we'll go into a bit, because I'd love to get your take on it. Um, and that it was like, oh, you silly, ignorant people. The headless woman was Marie Antoinette and this and that. And, and they tried to wrap it in a different, you know, bouquet. Like, no, 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 the big fat blue man on the plate, you know, offering himself up to be cannibalized um, was um, you know, Dionysus, the Greek god. What's wrong with you uneducated people? The Olympics is about, you know, they're from the Greeks, the Olympians, whatever. And then they're arguing on like on Facebook and people are so, no, this is wrong. And I, wow, what is your take on what you watched? 
Now, I've only watched snippets because I just don't allow myself to have that sort of stuff come into my field anymore. But because I run a, a Telegram chat, I did see quite a bit of it. And I was actually heartened by the fact that there has been such a backlash. This is not like the 2012 Olympics where people are looking at this enormous demon over these beds of all these children. I mean, oh, my God. Yeah. And wondering what on earth. Now they're knowing exactly what they're doing. They know that's about cannibalistic references. They know what's going on. I, I'm, I'm actually... I know it's disgusting, but I'm overjoyed because it's waking so many people up. And the, uh, from what I'm understanding, they had to take it down. Like they they couldn't, they, they stopped advertising it. They stopped actually allowing people to watch it. So that is a massive victory. That is a massive victory. We are not back in 2020 where people were saying conspiracy theorists, this and that. We are at the point where the majority of people now know that is disgusting and that is wrong. There was a child at the front at one point that was... Um, touching itself or herself or herself. I don't even know what gender the child was because you can't tell anymore, but um, because of what they were doing there obviously was not about the representation of a particular gender that they were born with. But the child was touching themselves in a, in a, a too familiar way for a child of that age. And someone had, an adult had kind of instigated it. And I had people in the chat saying that there was somebody saying that that child had been trafficked. That was a trafficked child that was actually on stage there. The fact that that came out also is massive. So all these people saw this weird ritual. It was a ritual, and they saw this little child touching themselves in a in a in a weird sort of kind of sexual way, instigated by an adult, and they're all protective and saying this is disgusting. We can't have this. I mean, if it if it had been if it if the majority of people had just said, oh yes, it's just oh it's, look, it's just it's just people on stage making a play of things, and you know, isn't it funny? And, and let's all be woke then it would be very distressing. But that's not what happened. That's not what happened. People are disgusted. Everywhere in the world, everybody's disgusted. I don't think there's terribly many people who looked at that and thought this is going to be a good idea. <laughs> Obviously, the people involved, I mean, it's probably just as well they're in costume because if they were acting, if that was purely just an act to wake people up, because I really don't know, I really couldn't tell you from looking at that if those people were truly genuine or if they were acting, to wake people up i find this whole what's been happening in the last particular last couple of years with these people wandering around that clearly are not the original politicians that we had before i find it incredibly perplexing so instead of having an opinion i just sit back and i just watch and i'm just like wow this is crazy this is crazy but i'm not surprised because we're coming up to a time when again attachments uh the puppeting demonic entities will not be able to exist here for very much longer they're pulling out every stop and they're not succeeding all that seems to be working is that we are all waking up more and more which is inevitable because the veil is disintegrating and people are seeing the truth and I, after 18 years of talking about what happened to me finally being validated as you said in, in one of our interviews you know being um with this victim of crime you know validation um payment it's just unbelievable to me, you know, if I went back 10 years and the, the horrible things that people were saying about me online and, and the trolls and my family that just had cognitive dissonance or were terrified of losing their credentials that they've been handed on a platter, like I was handed on my platter, I never believed, I never would have understood that this was coming. Even with the gift of prophecy, I, I couldn't see that this was coming. Um, so to be standing here now or sitting here now with in, in your beautiful company talking about this it's it's a really amazing time to be alive it is so amazing on so many levels and yeah that whole you know uh, to, the, the, to me that was a ritual you know it was clearly a ritual it was so sickening and it was so weird and it was so off it was like a minor chord as opposed to a major chord of kind of harmony oh. it was so dissonant what? and and disturbing and all that you, you know and I feel sorry for people who generally genuinely are transgender and don't want to look like freakoids don't want to look like male drag queens you know hideously unattractive but the the real genuine people that have needed to do something for self um but not not the parody of it that that, that we saw you know and it, it, it's sad because there's an element of um, a, a small group of people on our planet and I've met a few and I counseled uh as a therapist I counseled there was a couple they were both women and one changed to a man 
And he suffered so much. They never talk about the injections they had to stick in their bodies every single day. It is not easy at all. Um, so it's a shame that their drive to be all inclusive and, you know, look a certain way because they've changed gender, that it gets also kind of swept up in that as a oneness. So, you know, we've got to obviously have compassion for our brothers and our sisters and those on our planet. Um, but, um, yeah, so um, thank you for your 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 insight there. Um, on that because it is obviously definitely in our faces and um, it is very interesting to see how many people are so triggered they're just so triggered by it now um, the obviously there was an assassination attempt um, on Trump I was shocked at how many people um, were, were like he missed he missed like how did we get that debased in in our morals that it's okay to shoot another man live on television are we not so traumatized from Kennedy you know, this is not okay, it's never going to be okay. Um, and then uh, with um, that happening, and then they're missing, and then Biden, you know, got stepped down, and then said he's got COVID. No, he doesn't. He's, you know, I don't know, whatever, I don't want to get into it. You know, it's, it's, it, I feel sorry, only for the fact that it's an old doddery man. But people are so determined to have this as their president, that they're not looking, it's like the emperor's new clothes. When are we going to get past the emperor's new clothes? He's an old man and he's not fit for purpose. Get over it. Get someone else in. Stop lying to yourselves. It's like this whole, but we're there. And it's so intense with people. People are so crazed and they're so angry and they're so falling apart. But everyone's opportunity is there to look here, look inside, do that healing. Stop lying. Yeah, but Trump did this and Trump did that. And, and, and half the things that people say this person and that person did, they didn't. And you've got no proof because you weren't there in the room. You're listening to both sides of ownership, propaganda. It never stops. Um, let's. I love. Can I just? Can I just say? I love the fact that you use the emperor's new clothes metaphor because it's not the same Biden. It's such a brilliant metaphor, Danny. Because the earlobes are different. So, you know, it's obviously somebody or someone in a mask. I don't know what's going on there. But, yes, it's so weird to me that people can't see that. I, I find that, again, perplexing. I'm just sitting back looking and thinking, seriously? But I see a lot of people that used to look a certain way and don't look that way anymore. Um, someone shared a picture of, I don't know if it was a Kardashian or if it was um, another songstress. I, I, I couldn't tell the difference between a, a Kardashian <laughs> and... Um, this woman that used to sing and I can't, um, can't think of her name, of course, because I'm because we because we're recording. But they look the same. It's like it's like they're coming out of a carbon copy factory, and they don't even have the same features anymore. It's oh, honestly, I just get so confused. Yeah, it, it's all so I know is in my heart. Is, it, my heart is saying that is not the original person. I don't know what's going on here. I don't want to go into too many conspiracy theories, but this is weird. Can't everybody see that? So Emperor's new clothes, brilliant brilliant <laughs> wow and and the fact that the um the, the way people change it this um this manufactured um image of what beauty is that has been pushed so hard you know and everyone's influenced you know sometimes unconsciously influenced and it's just so like this is what beauty is and okay well i don't agree all right let's take a step back um into um some of the areas that we were going to share um, with your childhood and what you went through with your 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 um, dead um, evil dad, um, we mentioned the rituals, and now we're going to move a little bit into your father's trophies. Yeah, so um, I'll try to be very careful about what I say here because I don't want to trigger too many people. But you know, when you when you get to the point where people unalive large numbers of people they will keep mementos and unfortunately that's something that my father was involved in so it wasn't just that he took the the remains of the three Beaumont children which is a big case in my country um three children were taken all from the same family the only three children that this poor couple had they my father got hold of them and alive them and then buried them on his own property in, a, in an old sinkhole well that's the not the only thing that needs to be you know, looked into on that property. My grandfather, who also had ownership of that property before my father did, 
was a telecommunications officer, just as my father was. My father had a, a home with a telecommunications bunker under it in Macklin Street in Edwardstown. My grandfather's property has something very interesting underneath it also, which I haven't talked about very much um, in public, but it needs to be known that there's a hatch in the large shed that moves around. Um, my father would have a habit of, you know, he would have an access point. He would keep something on there so you couldn't find it, a boat or something that, you know, you couldn't see what was underneath the bit of rug that the boat was sitting on. And then he would concrete, he would put an extra concrete pad down on the whole place. He would just start concreting again. And then the, the hatch would be moved somewhere else. Now, this is a large space underneath the main shed. So that needs to be known. And I've I've made that um I've, I've spoken about it a little bit, but I wanted to talk about it because I know that, you know, you're, you've got a very discerning audience and there's enough about that property now out that it needs to be known. And I'm not the only person who saw that, who has knowledge of that space. That's not the only thing. There are many sinkholes in that area. I have a, um, I've, I've been informed that there's another area with a, um, a cave on the foreshore where there's an old half a gravestone, someone's dragged a half a gravestone into this place. Now the ocean couldn't carry a half granite gravestone into this space. He or somebody else dragged it in there. It's a marker for something. I was also forced as a five-year-old to, where you get a sinkhole in a gully. So what happens in a gully is if you've got um, sandstone or limestone, as the water travels down the gully, it, it'll leak through in certain places and create a space, an, an open space where, where, and as the water trickles through, it goes through another another underground tunnel out to the ocean. Well, there were there are several of these on that property, and he found the opening of one of them. Must have found it a very long time ago, but at five, he made me follow him in to a very small tunnel. I had to walk on my hands and knees as usual. He was well protected. He had a wetsuit on. I had my hands and my little knees and I was in a little top and skirt. I got all cut up because, you know, where, where, when you've got limestone, it's not soft. <laughs> and and along the coast of South Stansbury, it's really sharp rock, the way that the, the wind and the water erodes it. So I had to, it was a little bit of calcification, thank God, so that my hands were too, too cut up. So I had to follow him through this tunnel that he had to shimmy through because it was quite small. At the end of this tunnel, there was this sinkhole. There was a little bit of light in there because there was a hole at the top where the water was coming through. And he had all of these skulls, small skulls, and they had green kind of um, mildewy kind of a green sheen on the ones that were on the top. But there were so many there, it created a small like fence or wall inside this inside this sinkhole. And at five, I don't, I, I don't think I could count to 50 at five. I was too little. So... I have an understanding from the memory that there would have been roughly about 50 skulls in there. Now, hundreds of children went missing from the orphanages and boys' home close to my my childhood home um, that still are missing. Uh, there was uh, 4,000, I believe, um, UK children brought over to Australia. 2,000 of those never were seen of again. So we're talking huge numbers of children. And my father was responsible for, for processing many of them. And he kept these things. He kept them on the property. Now, when he died in 2017, this was right in the middle of an investigation. I'd finally found the right um, member of parliament who'd stood up for me um, and insisted on an investigation. And the man who was the police minister at the time is our current premier. Now, the investigation began in 2017 or 2016, 2017, and then my father promptly died, which was very convenient. Um and then the investigation ceased because you can't convict a corpse is what I was literally told by a, a special crimes detective. On the night that he died at one o'clock in the morning, the other person who lives on that property is a family member of mine, was burning fires. And the fires smelt very odd. And I won't necessarily say what they smelt like, but it smelt like some of these trophies were being burned. So, you know, we have reams of evidence that have been lost. You know, there were, there were mainstream... Um, journalists at the property at that time smelling this that they couldn't report on it they did they did ask this particular family member and you know that there's footage of him being asked you know what were you burning oh just 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 what was it just timber made or something just timber or wood or something he was saying um as he walked off oh gosh um you know that that whole property has to be completely raised to the ground 
completely razed to the ground and and then some it has to go underground that whole place and it should be a, a monument to all of these children eventually some sort of place where people can go and pay their respects it's a, it's a graveyard already it should be treated as such do you think your dad was bumped off oh i, I would say 100 percent. he was already in a nursing home but prior to his death he was strong enough and fit enough to assault one of the nurses so i know that happened mm. so you know he wasn't on his deathbed at that point um, and the only reason why he ended up in there was because one of my other family members had been keeping him in her, her house with her three small children despite all the allegations that we had made and i this is why i spoke out danny because i've got young family members and idiots in my family that wouldn't protect them from him and so she had gotten so frustrated with him at that point, she'd shoved him in a home. Um, not before she'd changed his will. <laughs> so I think that's why she got him in there. Charming individual. Um, yeah, so I, I think he got the pillow treatment or something. Someone someone got rid of him because the investigation was going on. And my father had a weird, weird tendency. He would be doing these terrible things, but he would also be whistleblowing at the same time. He had a tendency to write letters. Um, he, he believed he knew what happened in the NCA bombing, which is a famous bombing case in my in my country. Um, he put his hand up for a lot of things, actually. He said he knew this and he knew that and he knew what happened here and there. So he 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 was he was obviously had altars, you know, he was all over the place. Mm -hmm. I've got quite a few of those letters. That's so interesting. Um, okay, I think we've covered in previous conversations that the tragedy of this so-called father um helping himself to your little tiny body and those of your siblings in a way that a father should never no one should ever do uh the things that went over and over and over again um in your little life um i remember you sharing that um that that he would do that but also when there was a ritual where you were dressed as a bride and you mentioned it but literally it was a betrothal to Satan, but also a sickening link with him too. I mean, again, for people that have never heard, you know, some of these, um, you know, situations that we're sharing, this is real, this is reality, this satanic occult, the hidden hand, the dark magic with a, with a K has been happening for so many years, so, so many years. And I heard someone the other day who's a, um, he says it's Alistair Crowley, pronounce it properly and this man who said that is somewhat of a a scholar you know he studied you know Alistair for many many years so I don't know I don't care how to pronounce the man's name but you know that just came up um but goodness um yeah it, it's hard for people and sometimes people say I couldn't watch anymore you know and I understand that but we've got to push past that too because you know there's no point being precious we need to be loving and supportive and listen to people like you and your testimony and understand it is absolutely true. Not only is it true, and you've been so brave, you just took the Australian government to its very knees. You were an, awarded a pathetic amount um, of compensation because it was proven that you are and were harmed. You are a victim of crime. And can you just give us a, a synopsis of that? Because it is historical and it was you that did it in all of Australia. Yeah, so it's very, very rare. So people do get victim of crime payments, but it's usually for things that aren't what the sort of things that I talk about. And it's certainly not when you have no conviction. You know, it's it's extremely rare. So I embarrassed a friend of my brother when we told when and he told him that I'd I'd had this payment. Um, it's called an ex gratia payment and it's at the discretion of the attorney general. So it's for someone who doesn't have a conviction against the abuser. And and the barrister said that just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen in this state but I but I but I've I've had that happen so the thing is they couldn't really ignore it anymore because a major crime detective had already told my brother that they know our father was involved with the Beaumont disappearance so if he's involved with that and they're acknowledging that that he's obviously involved with the abuses that I've been speaking about and I have reams of evidence of medical reports procedures I've had to go through a statutory, de statutory declaration from my mother because he ran me over in an attempt to kill me she was present um, and watched him pull, pulling me out. Um, there, there is um, my my psychiatric report 
that I name all the most important people that abuse me in. So they can't ignore that anymore. And it's interesting, there was one particular individual named in that psychiatric report and many of my statutory declarations who was investigated were abusing me as a child, my father's best friend. Um, he was investigated in 2018. As usual, you know, they just deny it and they get away with it. He he has thrown my father under the bus and said that my father introduced him to the Beaumont children. So that that is another witness account that, and, you know, he's obviously thrown my father under the bus trying to protect himself. Maybe he's getting some sort of deal. He's very old and he's got prostate cancer. Yay. Um, so, you know, I, I really do believe that it's all just about to come out. And this is why I'm speaking about what's underground at Stansbury now, at my father's former property. That needs to be investigated. God knows what's happening in there now. Who, who knows if there's still people being taken in there? I don't know. I don't go there. Uh, I wouldn't be silly enough to go there because I might end up in there. So, you know, these hidden spaces underground are the most dangerous because you can't hear sound. Um, nobody expects it to be there. I, it, I spent me... Well, I, I spent two and a half years pulling together through the research of others and my own, um, the evidence of the tunnels that I was trafficked through as a child. Uh, it took two and a half years to do that because I couldn't get help from council because they pretend it doesn't exist. And I can sort of understand why. Who wants to know that there's a tunnel under their house that's making their house collapse or their shed or whatever else? So, you know, what's hidden underground needs to come to the surface in many different ways. It's very important that, you know, there's a lot of talk now of people understanding that a lot of tra trafficking occurs underground. Um, a dear friend of mine, Emma Catherine, who has the Imagination podcast, she does very much like what you do. You know, she 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 gives a voice to people that um, YT doesn't normally allow to speak on their, on their channels. And she shared a post on Twitter and it was um, something about British Telecom having a new, new brain chip <laughs> where you can have this chip put in your brain to improve your memory, the telecommunications companies, the telecommunications companies in Western countries are intrinsically evil, in my opinion. My, my father was a telecom operative. He was an ASIO operative. He had a telecommunications bunker. They have these underground spaces. They use them for nefarious purposes. It's not just about allowing you to make a phone call or use your internet. These spaces, there are all these tunnels all over Australia, every main street, every main road, a lot of those tunnels and pits are huge and they're walkable and things can be trafficked through them. People, uh, contraband, anything. Yeah, um, two things there, telecoms and bunkers. So first of all, telecoms, communications, satellite communications also. Last night I went to pop out with a family member to go get something and, and then I realized that my lights weren't coming on and the car I have, they call it a smart car, whatever, I've got no interest. I don't I haven't even hooked my phone up to it because, you know, I know that these cars can be remote controlled, you know, by the asshats at the top. And um, I get a few yards down the road and say to my family, uh, there's a problem. I'm not driving. We, you know, we've got to get the, the car back to the house. It's dangerous. There's no lights coming on. And that happened because I allowed, you know, sometimes, you know, we make errors. I mean, I'm always doing that. I let this man clean my car, this poor man. I let him clean my car inside and out. And so while he's been doing whatever, he's obviously, you know, and I am not the brightest firework at the party. I just am not. And I'm sitting there last night trying to figure out with a light and trying to, where are the lights? And anyway, something happened and uh, something started ringing and we're ringing mini, uh, the um, uh, manufacturer that's built into my car. I'm like, oh my God. Then this man answers the phone inside my car, inside the central console, a bloke answers. And uh, it was the service, you know, where are you? Are you safe? Yes. What's going on? And I could hardly understand him. He had a very different accent to mine. Um, and, oh, it was just like so, I knew it. I know it. And then in the car contracts now, people really have to look because they, the asshats, can actually take control, remote control, remote control, remote control. And uh, there was talk of an American actress who um, a car was driven into a wall at great speed. And there are some that said that car was remote control. So this is a very big area of, you know, we've got 5G, this was for flying cars and for teleports and it was all meant to be. And yet we sit in our houses and the internet drops. You know what I mean? That level of technology was not meant for us. It was meant for them. Now bunkers, um, we know there are 
gigantic military operations happening across the entire planet. There's often a military base where there is a phenomena like Uluru, let's say, which is also known as Ayers Rock in Great Britain, let's say, in other Western speaking countries. And these military bases have many of them um, situations that go down many levels, many stories, even miles under under underground. Now the Ashats, the most wealthy ones, they wasted an opportunity to do a deal and return some frequency keys and some very important information and to unspell some of the black magic occult spelling that they did. And there was a meeting in Antarctica, which is a very, very, very active place. There's so much happening in Antarctica. You know, plus it has such a massive German influence. They even named some of the places there, New Berlin, New Schwabenland. It has all been proven. A friend of ours of the channel, Brad Olson, actually physically went down there and photographed. You know, we can watch stuff online, but it's good that, you know, he's a friend. He came on my channel, you know, he's spoken at my conference. I'm a love Brad Olson. Um, but I don't want to get too distracted here because these people wasted an opportunity. They thought they would be fine. These are the darkest of the dark. They are now stuck on the planet. Now, they can't get off planet on the anti-gravity crafts because the Galactic Federations or whatever it is that's coming in, including the American space fleet, which is called Solar Warden, the French space fleet, one of their craft is called the Solaris. Everyone is going to get a hammering who's harmed people on our planet. And the underground bunkers, these asshats have been making underground bunkers and they think they're going to be hiding in their little bunkers until everything's calmed down. They, they've got to be joking. They think this, well, they're so wealthy, some of them, beyond our comprehension. They are going to know what's coming for them. And also humanity, as humanity is awakening very quickly, people say again, oh, humans aren't ready for it yet. It will shock the humans. Remember what Orson Welles did on the radio in the 1920s and everybody was scared? They say that because they're friggin' scared. And when humanity realizes that darkness rules this planet, evil and black magic rules this planet, it went nowhere. And the people that run it are so full of demonic, uh, demonic entities that they've sold their soul. Singers, dancers, performers, every level of what we celebrate, what we're programmed to celebrate. And humanity isn't going to be shocked. Humanity is, humanity is going to go mad and they are going to come for those evil people and that is what time it is yes absolutely Dylan. absolutely you're so spot on yeah i wouldn't want to be in their shoes no they won't be in any kind of shoes for very long will they maybe concrete yeah. maybe concrete um we um as we go there a little bit um another thing for people to unfortunately acknowledge is that you were forced into filming as was Kathy O'Brien as well like you were filmed into por porn filming porn with other children and adults um, and some of these you were a marked child that was allowed to live despite the almost unaliving several times of your own beautiful self um, but they make what we call snuff films people pay to watch children unalive. And these people are at the highest level of politics and academia, and that is a fact, and that can be proven, right? It's absolutely horrifying. So um, I know there's still memories that need to come up of, of the snuff work that my father was involved in. Um, I have little bits and pieces, but I try, well, it's very hard, but I don't wanna look at it um, because it's so horrific, but... Um, he was definitely involved in that. He, he made a lot of child rape material. I was part of it um, on many occasions. You know, I, I still don't really enjoy taking my photograph. I um, don't really like to be filmed, but it's not as bad as it used to be. I notice that sometimes when I'm doing interviews, even I pull a certain face that I used to pull as a child when I was being photographed and filmed. Because it's like, um, even as a small child, trying to make myself look as unattractive as possible, my jaw sort of takes over my face. Um, and it still happens at times. It happens when I sing. Um, I get this, uh, you know, it's very hard to just let myself vocalise because of the training and, and the programming to stop me from vocalising. So even then, you know, this this jaw thing will happen. And I've seen it in others as well. I was talking to a survivor the other day and she was talking about how that, you know, she's got this locked jaw. And, um, yeah, um, what my father was involved in, 
if you can imagine it being possible, he did it. There was no, there was no, there was never any compassion, ever. There's no compassion for us, for any of his children of his own. Like he didn't show compassion. There, there was nothing. Um, it was like an empty vessel. He could pretend kindness in certain situations. If we're at a party, for instance, and it wasn't the group, it wasn't his group, it was, it was a different group of people. He would pretend to be this magnanimous, wonderful father. And, you know, I remember going up to him at those times because I liked the pretend dad. I liked that pretend person because I wished and hoped that that would be the real person. And I often used to think, I wonder if he'll still be like that at the end of the party. But he never was. Um, so, you know, what they have on the dark web, these these people who do these things, they have no, they have no soul. You cannot do that sort of thing to a child and have a soul. So whatever was controlling my father um, in those times certainly wasn't it wasn't human, in my opinion. I call I call them creatures when they have that that um, that emptiness. It's this dark emptiness. There's nothing really. There's nothing human about it. It's the only way I can describe it. Um, you know, and he he would use knives on his own children. So. <laughs> And this is the thing, you know, there were a whole series of children that went missing um, and were found that, you know, that their remains were found, that there were knife wounds that he perpetrated on me, one of them. And, you know, I've got medical report to prove it, that, that he did that to me. Um, but they still won't, they won't investigate him for those murders. I, I saw one of these murder victims, Richard Kelvin, in the underground cellar. And we were filmed together with another missing child who went missing within six months of Richard going missing. <laughs> and they they will never connect those two missing children together because they daren't. Oh, mind you, I've put out enough evidence. There's so much evidence, it's ridiculous. There's photographic evidence linking my father to these children. Um, you know, and there was a there was a chief in inspector of police who was involved in that photo, uh, that filming. Um, and I, um, he helped bring in Richard. So... So these are the family murders that Adelaide's known for, uh, that my father was involved in. So he had, he had, he had impunity. He could do whatever he wanted. His friends did also. He's the only one that's really been named. Um, I will eventually name those that that you know as soon as they die, I will make it very clear who they were and what they did. Shame they have to die, isn't it? Shame they have to. So many people get away with so much and people are like, oh, they're old now. Well, so what? So what? You know, they should be named and shamed and taken to task before they, they get to snuff it. You know, it's just not. Uh, um, um, tell us about the um, the evil people who are awarded their, I call it the academic snobbery, but awarded their degrees. Go into that a little bit, please. So we have a particular situation with the psychology um, fraternity in, in Australia. So if you want to become a psychologist, you have to go through your master's degree. So you actually have to go to the point of learning um, and having and getting your master's, which it's a long, I think it's about a seven year process. Um, I didn't do great in year 12, which is the matriculation at the end of high school. Um, my uh, matricul matriculation um, score was about 68. It got moderated down to about 63. I had, I've been told by my my programmer and my father that I needed to apply for a Bachelor of Science degree. I was 13 or 16 points, I think, no, 16 points too low to get into this degree. That's a lot of points. It's 16% too low to get into this degree. So I applied, I got rejected. I didn't even get to a Bachelor of Arts degree, which is way lower, but I still couldn't, I couldn't even apply for that. I could, well, I applied, but I certainly couldn't get in. And my father rang me up one day and said, did you get in? And I said, no. And he was furious. And he got off the phone. He hung up on me, got off the phone. And within a very short period, oh, a matter of half an hour, hours, something like that, I had a phone call. And I was being told by um, Flinders University, which is one of the main universities here, that I was, um, I was enrolled in a Bachelor of Science degree, something that I didn't have access to because I didn't have the right marks and I certainly didn't have the prerequisite um, studies. I didn't have anything that would get me into a science degree. I, I was an arts major, um, a visual art major, actually. I didn't do maths. I didn't do, um, I did biology. That was the only science subject that I did. I didn't do maths or physics or chemistry, which are prerequisites to get into that degree. Now, I was told when I, when I struggled, 
I was supposed to be doing things in the science area and, and I was try, trying to learn physics and chemistry for the first time at a university level, never having any background in it. I did I did um, very basic maths in year 10. That's the last time I did anything like that. And I was told by my MK Ultra handler and my father that all I had to do to finish that degree, because they wanted me to be a psychologist, was to go to, to the exams and I didn't even have to put pen to paper and I would pass. So I got out of there quick smart. I I, I didn't even um, complete a year of that Bachelor, bachelor of Science degree. I, co I completed the philosophy. I did a philosophy, an arts subject. I, I completed that. But I, I deferred and then I withdrew. But I have my academic transcripts to prove that I didn't have the marks. I could, didn't have the prerequisite subjects. But I got my transcript from Flinders University show that, showing that I was I was allowed into that Bachelor of Science degree. I think that there are an enormous number of academics particularly in the psychology sciences in my country, who are mentored into those positions. And then they're used. So they are used to, there's a, a man called Bob Montgomery, who was very high up in the psychological sciences in my country. And he was a raging pedophile and he was found out and he was protected. He was protected for a very long time. And the individuals who protected him still have high positions. And these individuals are, you know, Pedophile protectors, basically, and this is this is the the hinging of the child state child trafficking industry because they use these psychologists who are mentored into these positions and academics of all kinds, doctors, academics of all kinds that are mentored by the cult through nepotism and cronyism into these positions to write up reports to take children from parents that can then be trafficked. It's, it's a horror show, and that's just the child trafficking aspect. That doesn't take into account all the other areas where people are, you know, patting themselves on the back and doing special handshakes and getting in where they can. And, you know, people who perhaps they're builders, developers, whatever, they get their special little way in. So, you know, this is how people are blackmailed because if they've got their academic cred credentials through some means like that, they're not going to speak up about the abuses that they might have suffered as children if they've been allowed to get into a comfortable position but they certainly have to sell their soul because you can't go into doing, you know, lying in court and lying about, you know, a protective parent, you know, um, trying to, um, what's the word, um, make the other parent look, look like a bad person when, when you know, obviously they are because you know, a lot of these people are pedophiles. They, the children are just handed back to the pedophile parents almost every time. It's It just beggars belief what's going on so that's that's how the place has been run for a very long time I don't think that's going to continue because I think people are very aware of it absolutely you know um yeah there's so many ways we could go here and you know we've really covered so much um today and you've really shared so much and uh I again just applaud you for it um, so deeply um and again for people to have less respect for authority um, in a sensible way, you know, oh, Danny Henderson, she's suggesting anarchy. Uh, well, okay, <laughs> no, um, I'm, I'm, it's not something to be played with, but people just need to really realise and stop being so doughy-eyed or dewy-eyed over singers and actors and politicians and footballers. And it's like, wake up time. It's wake up time. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, let's bring this beautifully round to what has flowered from you in terms of a being selected to speak at Uluru in December 2021-22 um, which is beautiful and honor and you're so delighted I love how delighted you are but but tell us a little bit about how you discovered that you can energetically help heal the planet from the ritualizing um, bloodletting that is done on the ley lines and tell us more um, about that beautiful work that you're now doing? Well, it's very interesting. About 10, it's probably more like 12 years now um, ago, I started photographing a lot. Like I, I just love going in nature and taking photographs. And it was then that I started to realise I'm seeing these circles along these paths. What are they? Um, and intuitively, when I was asking the question, I got, well, they're ley lines. And so I got curious and I and I went out and took more photographs in those particular locations and I took photographs with different cameras, handheld cameras, phone cameras, different phone cameras. And those those portals and those ley lines were still visible. And so it sort of struck me, well, people can see them. And then I learned that in the Aboriginal Australians in, in my country call them 
song lines. And then I learned that there's an interplay between sound and light that creates a frequency. And that these song lines are frequency channels like tunnels. Um, and that they're actually fifth dimensional and that that's the repository for the Akashic record. I realized that in a lot of these photographs, there were humanoid apparitions around the ley lines. And I realized that there was the spirit of nature trying to communicate something very profound. And I sat on that information and reams of these photographs for you know, a good 10 years before I started to speak out about it. But it suddenly occurred to me, speaking in interviews, and it was, I'd spoken it a couple of times before, but then I had an interview with a gentleman called Ben Hawkes and as we were talking, it sort of kind of came into my mind that the, part of the reason why I survived was to do the work that needs to be done now, which is bringing loving, healing frequencies, balancing frequencies into the lays, into these spaces that I had been taken into as a child to witness the most horrific, horrific rituals. That that ritual programming needs to be undone because it's done for a reason. There's a reason why these dark elements will take the risk of doing these open air rituals and making sure that they have all the police and all of the court system and all the park rangers in that particular area in their group so that they will cover it up. It's so important to them to do all of that so they can have these open air rituals. It must be so significantly important that we need to undo it. And I realized how important it was. And Ben and I then, you know, Ben, Ben realised the significance and importance of it as well. So he and I um, co-founded Lay Love Down. So if people want to join us, it's www.laylovedown, L-E-Y, lovedown.com. We are calling on all the light workers of the world to join us, to go out into the ley lines, to sing in frequencies of love and freedom for everybody on earth, to bring us to these higher frequencies, to help the earth to heal because it's a very important thing. She needs our help. She needs to heal. Forget all the carbon neutral rubbish. That's all just an overplay. We are made of carbon. It's ridiculous. She needs us to love her and give her our energy. Um, and, you know, her spirit is calling for this as well. So that is that is my passion. Helping people to see, to learn how to find them, um, to get out, out into the lays, to get back into nature. Because I know with all the lockdowns and things that we've had, uh, there was a big reason for that. It wasn't just the things that they said. It was to keep us away from nature, to disconnect. And this is what big cities are like. That This is what it's about, disconnect. We have to reconnect with nature. Um, and I think that's going to be natural. I think people are just going to naturally gravitate towards nature again. The more high um, and sensitive souls that I meet tend to gravitate towards nature. They can't seem to live in the big cities, or if they do, they're doing very important work there. They're anchoring a light there, and it's very hard work, and I take my hat off to them because I, I don't think I could manage it. I live in the country for a reason. Um, so that's, that's you know, it's one thing to have come from such darkness, but this is this is why I'm here. I believe this is why I survived, because this this time that we're in is so incredibly significant and we need to pay attention to the ley lines now, help help heal the, heal the earth, which again is why the, the consciousness, Cosmic Consciousness Conference is such a, you know, such an honour um, and the timing. I couldn't be more perfect. It's just uh, amazing. And again, spirit always does that, you know. I'm always helped. It's so beautiful. Spirit, the, the light, the love that we all have access to, the wonderful energetic <clears throat> guidance, divine guidance. Um, <clears throat> it's beautiful. It's beautiful. You are beautiful. Um, I'm I'm so proud of you. Um, I love you. And I love you coming on my channel and, and sitting and, and just being so brave. You know, I just so honor you for that. And, you know, I won't keep continuing to say that because I know it's not that comfortable. I don't want to be gushing, but I just wanted to, you know, I know there are many people that watch you on my channel and on Shanti's channel on, here we go, on Aquarius Rising Africa. Aquarius Rising Africa, right? A R A Shanti Chantal Mayberg, love that lady. Um, you know, you you do a lot with her as well. So we're, you know, between the two of us, Shanti and I are really, you know, loving on you and 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 protecting you, but you know, giving you a um, a bigger platform because that's the right thing to do. People out there with big platforms, you selfish muppets, 
bring Rachel Vaughan on your channel. Stop trying to protect your content and your images. And this is a time of spiritual war that we're in. And we need to be stepping up to the plate or just get off, you know, just, <laughs> just do you mind logging in? You know, when people won't, oh, I can't do that. I reached out to a girl once. She's got over a million uh, views and I, I know her family and I've worked with her mother, her genius scientist, scientist mother, um, who created this incredible range of skin products. And, um, you know, I've read for the girl, I've, you know, met her and stuff. And I said, I wanted to obviously, you know, bring awareness um, to very important subjects in my conference, JISIC, um, and um, said, would you, would you consider like having me on? You know what I mean? And she's so sweet when I met her and so interested in spirituality and and uh, it was like, no, you know, and, you know, I think people now need to just stop worrying about, you know, and just take that left hand turn, guys, and get on the track of love and justice for your planet. Um, let me come to you for final words of the day, darling Rachel Vaughan. Well, thank you again, Danny, and I love you too, and I love Shanti, and I, and I, and I love, you know, Emma Catherine and all these incredible people like yourselves who, again, you know, this is not easy work. It's triggering. It's it's distressing. You know, you probably get some people on your channel, like they say, you know, they can't watch anymore. And, and bless them. I, I really appreciate that they would even watch some. Um, I just thank you so much for for allowing people like me on here and for being such a, you know, you're such a you're such a strong voice for people who've gone through severe trauma. And I understand it's because of the work that you do, you would come across so many people who've gone through these sorts of abuses because it's really not uncommon if it's not you know SRA it's you know the, the sexual abuse is rife absolutely rife um and you know when you're a reader you you get that whether you with the, whether the client's telling you what or not you will pick up on it it's really hard so I can see you know this is probably the combination of um of having to listen and or having had listened to so many people going through similar sort of horrors and doing the right thing which is it's a beautiful thing to see and I really appreciate it darling I really do thank you well Rachel um until next time my love um I bid you adieu and I give my love to the audience that will watch this and you know be mindful of self and what comes up be okay with feelings that come up and if you need to cry scream shout be outraged and allow yourself those feelings we've got to stop shoving the feelings down and keeping the lid on. Let's let the lid out. Let's let the lid off. We all deserve to heal and everyone is healing from something. So my name is Danny Henderson. Um, my beautiful friend, Rachel Vaughan here. Um, we'll see her again and I will see you guys soon. <laughs>